All right, joining me now all the way from Taiwan is Dr. Stephen Quay. Hi, Stephen. Hi, Dana, how you doing? Great, before we launch into the theories of the origins of COVID-19, let's just establish who you are because it's important, right? Because we're talking about science. So you are part of the Paris group, which as I understand is a couple of dozen, just over a couple of dozen scientists with, um, some of them are mathematicians, they're not scientists. There's a lot of different disciplines in there, but that group was formed because, and what is its raison d'etre? It's, it's mainly a curiosity around the origin. Um, everybody has you know, pretty busy day jobs of, of one form or another, but we've committed to meeting once a month uh, by Zoom um, for about four hours. And we usually have someone in the group or we have a group, someone outside the group present uh, some scientific aspect of it. Uh, and then we have discussions. I mean, we've, we've put out two letters uh, publicly to um, support the WHO and to, and to support investigations, further investigations. And that occupies some of our time, uh, the logistics of getting those letters done and the sort. But, uh, and you are a doctor of what and what is really your specialty and your strength? So uh, I have an MD, PhD, PhDs in chemistry. Uh, I taught at Stanford Medical School for about 10 years. I heard of um, that. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty good school down there in, in, in the mid-peninsula of California. Uh, my uh, uh, residency was at the Mass General at, at Harvard, and I was at, in, in a Nobel Prize winner's laboratory at MIT. So during the day, I was learning to be a doctor, and at night, I was doing photochemistry across the river at MIT. So you're uh, not a virologist. You're not a, I'm not a virologist. I, no, I've, in, I've invented a treatment for, uh, for a particular uh, influenza uh, using siRNA. So I have 87 patents and I've invented uh, seven drugs that are FDA approved, including the, the gadolinium that's used for MRI contrast. So uh, about 80 million people have used that drug. So uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a really nerdy scientist. <laughs> it's, it's probably the core of Steve Quay is uh, back in the day, 20, 30 years ago, I would take, a, take home an inch of, before the internet, an inch of scientific papers that I'd Xeroxed. And that was my sitting on the patio with a drink on Sunday afternoon. Uh, that's the way I spent my, my weekend. So. Fast forward, I now do it on the internet. Let's talk about the origins of COVID-19 because you were also, I understand, a signatory to this letter um, from, again, about 26 scientists. I don't know if they're the same as the Paris group. I know some of them overlap, um, which essentially, essentially says to the WHO, look, your investigation was flawed from the beginning. The, the membership uh, that Chinese demanded in terms of the scientists uh, that were on that panel essentially gave the Chinese government a veto. And your findings, you tell me how you want to put it diplomatically, uh, just don't hold water and we need to start again. Uh, yes, that's essentially what the letter says. And, uh, you know, there was a second letter that actually <laughs> tried to offer a blueprint of if you are going to start again, th these are the people you need. This is these are the, the skill set of the people you involve. These are the steps you should take, et cetera, et cetera. So tried to lay it out pretty clear. Um, so with any sort of impetus, they have they have the tools they need to to do it right a second time. Where do you line up on the theories? There there is one that says maybe it was in bats, and then it jumped to another host, and then it became, um, you know, it, it was then transmitted to humans and and uh, was able to replicate in humans and grow. The other is a lab escape. Yeah. So um, I've written a, a Bayesian analysis uh, of what uh, of those two theories. Uh, I uploaded it on Zenoda, I think in the end of January. It's been viewed 140,000 times. So just for perspective, I've written about 360 publications, scientific publications on various fields in that. Uh, this one is <laughs> one or two orders of magnitude better than anything else I've ever written. So, so it's Bayesian been... is kind of a um, of statistical math formulations on what are the odds, right? And That is correct. And, and I understand that you think through your Bayesian calculations um, that a lab origin was 99.8% possibility. Yes, uh, in the legal standard, it's called beyond a reasonable doubt. So um, Bayesian is a three-step process. You, you establish a prior probability based on whatever you can get your hands on. You do an experiment and you see which way it leans. You drop it into Bayes' equation, which is a very simple bit of math. My eighth grade daughter does it you know, routinely. And then you get, a new, you get a new outcome. So 
26 pieces of evidence were run. My starting hypothesis was 98% probability it came from nature. But as you said, I ended up uh, greater than 99% from the laboratory. Okay, so let's kind of walk through this a little bit. Um, first of all, in terms of hosts, if you, yes. if you go back after an outbreak of a pandemic, you generally find patient zero and then you, I, uh, or patient number one or whatever it's called. And then you go back and you find the animal hosts. Um, in SARS 2003, there was an, an, an immediate host. So that, was a, that was a cat. Yeah, it's called the civet cat. It was found four months after the first patient. Then in 2013 with mirrors, a camel. That took 10 months, but you're exactly right. It was the camels. SARS COVID-2, we're more than a year into this. 16 months, 80,000 samples of various animals around China. I mean, one, one of the biases is that you, you absolutely know China has to be motivated to find it in nature, right? I mean, I think that's an intrinsic e either bias or preference. But so after testing 80,000 animals and not finding a single case of it, um, to me, that's one of the most screaming pieces of evidence that, that came out of the WHO study that really needs to be addressed. Chinese would say they just never came from China, that you need to go look in Thailand, in Thailand or somewhere else. You know, one of, the, one of the problems with any of this theory is the, the, the virus keeps a clock or a calendar or a diary, however you want to describe it. But basically, you can use mutational analysis and phylogenetics to say which virus came before which virus and therefore put them in chronologic order. Um, that is one of the important things I do in the Bayesian analysis is the, the genetic patient zero. I don't believe it's patient, I don't believe it is the actual patient zero because it's December 20th thereabouts but was from a PLA hospital. Every patient and every specimen from the seafood market is downstream from that. Uh, every every it's, patient- It's quite close to the Wuhan Institute of Virology, by the way. Well, they all are, yes. I mean, I, I, I actually did a separate, another investigation where, which concludes with what I call the line two COVID conduit, which is, is basically sh looking at which hospitals where the December patients went with the assumption that they went to the nearest hospital to where they live, kind of. Mm -hmm. uh, and then which, which of the nine subway lines they were near, all hospitals were along line two. And that is a, like a one in an 80,000 probability. Okay, why is it important? That, where does line two run to and from? Some very unique features. So it, 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 it's the closest uh, station to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. So uh, if, if an if a, a asymptomatic worker came out and took the subway, they would go downstairs. It carries 1 million people a day in normal times, you know, obviously back then before that. So that's, so if you imagine it's a back and forth for people from the suburbs going to work, that's a half a million people. And that's probably coincidentally, but nonetheless, the number of people of infections they said they had in, in, in Wuhan was 500,000. It also has the wet market as its closest, uh, as its closest subway station. And in fact, the WHO said they had a map of the infections inside the wet market and they're, they're asymmetric. So the west entrance has more infections than the east entrance. And it's the west ent entrance that is closest to the uh, line two subway. Now it gets really cool for amplification because the, the next station from the, from, the, from the wet market is the station where the high-speed rail goes. So from that station, you can go to any corner in China that the high-speed rail services in a matter of hours. If you continue to the end of line two, you're at the international airport. So you can literally go from the Wuhan Institute of Virology downstairs, never go outside again, and come outdoors in London or Paris or Dubai or Houston, um, being entirely indoors. So uh, I'm, I'm really looking for someone to help me with an analysis to show how much amplification that subway connection probably had. Because it's independent of whether it came from the market or the lab, it satisfies both of those. But carrying a half a million people a year and having those two major conduits inside of China and into the world, it, it probably is part of the reason this thing spread so, so aggressively. Where do you think COVID-19 began? Some people trace it back to a, a bat cave. Um where several miners became sick. Uh, I think three of them died. And those samples were later taken to the Wuhan lab uh, where they were doing work on them, trying to understand the, the bat viruses. And if, if and indeed it came from a bat at all, it came from a cave. Yeah, yeah. So, so we know that, that 
again, after 16 months and, and, and literally thousands of animal testings looking for closest relatives, um, the closest relative is inside the, came from inside the one instance of virology, a, a, a bat called, a bat virus called RETG13. It was collected in 2013 uh, in, those, in those same mines where the miners were sick. Um, there were, uh, there were uh, literally hundreds of samples collected and there, there are eight really critical ones that we would love to have the sequences for because we've seen phylogenetic trees. So Dr. Shi has you know, done, done presentations and she's, she's teased us with these other seven that are very, very close to RATG13, but no one in the world knows, outside of the Wuhan Institute, knows what their sequences are. Uh, I think a lot of us suspect that probably a, a closer relative and the actual precursor to the gain of function research that led to SARS-CoV-2 is one of those other seven. My take is RATG is too far. Uh, you've got to come up with 1,100 changes to get from RATG to, to SARS-CoV-2. I can do about 600 with kind of two quick things in the lab, but the other, the other 500 are, are too difficult. We know that that lab at one point was doing gain of function which is essentially a scientific, a scientific term where you scientists, and it's very controversial, it was banned in the United States at one point where scientists work with viruses and they try to strengthen them and try and determine when they, they may, through mutations, jump to humans and thereby head off the next pandemic. And then, you know, there's been a lot of denials by the Chinese that they were doing gain of function and yet it, it was published at one point that the, the bat lady, the, the woman who ran the lab essentially was indeed doing gain of function, but did that lead to COVID-19? So you, do, you wanna, do you wanna try and string some of that together for me? Well, there's, uh, look, look at Dr. Shi, Dr. Barrick have worked together. Uh, they are either, they're one and two and you can, you can pick which is which. It depends on the day and the, and the year probably, but they're the number one and two coronavirus uh, scientists in the world uh, doing synthetic biology, which is gain of function, which is basically taking them apart, putting them back, back together, mixing, mixing pieces from different species of viruses. With human uh, uh, backbone or element? Well, well, well with, 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 they're, always, they're always a bat virus backbone. So, so this coronavirus, no matter where it ends up, started at some point in time in bats. And whether the intermediate host is a, is a camel or a civet or, or something else, uh, in, in this case, we think it's probably uh, humanized mice, um, but nonetheless, and, and, then, and then it jumps to humans. But so, What's a humanized mice? Mouse. Um, yeah, it's a, little, it's a little scary, but so you take, you take a mouse embryo and you put human genes into the embryo um, so that when it's born, it's a, it's a mouse, but it has human lungs, respiratory system, so if you want to test what will happen precisely in humans, uh, it's, it's a great model for that. Now, Dr. Barrick developed that model and he, his mice physically went from North Carolina to, to the Wuhan Institute. That's documented again in, in publications where she, she thanks him for his mice. It just sounds like dark arts, quite frankly, but I'm not a scientist. You know, it's, well, it's, it's, it is. Uh, and by the way, I mean, I'm not, I'm not altogether naive either because I've talked to, I, you know, I, I was based in Russia covering biological chemical uh, warfare, the dismantling of the former Soviet unions, um, in, incredible programs and uh, an assistant secretary of defense, not a Republican, a Democrat in that case under the Obama administration told me that um, the gain of function research is highly controversial and should be banned and was banned and uh, it, it's high high risk you know again a, a dark art in in a, in essence well it absolutely is again in my basic analysis i talk about the fact that it's it, it's absolutely published for 30 years there has been on average 0.9 so that rounds to one one laboratory acquired infection per year in asia so uh these are these are sars cov1 uh you know other viruses one a year so, um, you know, you're just playing Russian roulette with uh, the 7 billion people on the planet. 